Good morning. You'll notice that my normal books are not behind me today, and uh, uh, I'm actually recording this at home uh, because my wife and I are in quarantine after being exposed to someone who had COVID this week. Uh, be praying for us, would you, as we wait for results of uh, the COVID test. Uh, but uh, in the meantime, we need to go into God's Word. So I want to take you today to Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 18. Uh, I'm actually going to be reading from the Christian Standard Bible today. If you have a different translation, that's okay. Let me read that for you. Therefore, my dear friends, just as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but even more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is working in you both to will and to work according to his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling and arguing so that you may be blameless and pure, children of God who are faultless in a crooked and perverted generation among whom you shine like stars in the world by holding firm to the word of life. Then I can boast in the day of Christ that I didn't run or labor for nothing. But even if I am poured out as a drink offering on the sacrificial service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. In the same way, you should be glad and rejoice with me. Uh, the title of this message this morning is Star Quality Christians. I've never thought of myself as a star, at least not in the way that the world defines that term. For example, any famous person in the world of entertainment or sports, few of us ever rise to that rarefied atmosphere, but I don't envy them, nor do I begrudge them their moment in the spotlight. But it does make me stop and think, who are the stars from God's point of view? Who are the heavenly celebrities who shine like stars? Actually, this is a, a very familiar image. Jesus himself said in Matthew, you are the light of the world. He also said, let your light shine before men so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. The Apostle Paul used the same thing in our text this morning. You shine like stars in the world. Now that word star was also used in the first century uh, as a navigation beacon that would shine in the dark to guide ships safely into the harbor. Christians are to be bright stars, points of light in a dark world. We are put here to shine the light and guide others safely home to God. Paul told the Philippians that they were stars in the world. So how do you spot star quality Christians? All Christians have made five important commitments, and this text will help us to flesh those out. Verse 12 says, Therefore, my dear friends, just as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but even more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So the first point is, I will do my part. Notice Paul's first exhortation. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, a lot of people have been confused by this statement because they read it as if it says, work for your own salvation. And that, of course, is impossible. Even Paul himself clearly says in Ephesians chapter 2 that we are saved by grace through faith, not by works. You cannot work your way into salvation because it is, as he says, a gift of God. So, what does he mean then in this verse? I think the answer is actually found in the next verse where Paul reminds us that it is God who is working in you. 
just like everything else, what we call provenient grace, God, the, God gives us grace first, salvation always starts with God. He works in us to save us, and then we are to work out what God has worked in. We are to work out the implications of our salvation in every area of our lives. Salvation begins when you accept Jesus, but it doesn't end there. For one thing, it radically changes the way that you view God's will. Here's the great, great question of life for every believer. Am I willing to do God's will without strings attached? Many of us put conditions on our obedience to God. We're, we're willing to obey God if God will promise to keep us safe and healthy, if he will guarantee us a good job, a, a happy family, no problems with our, children, with our children, a long life with no debilitating diseases, a good retirement. Let me say plainly that the God of the Bible makes no such deals with his children. The call of Christ is always the same. Come, follow me. Actually, come, take up your cross and follow me. We are called to follow Christ and to leave all the other details in his hand. So let me ask you this question. Are you willing to do God's will with no strings attached. The next commitment we make is in verse 13. I will depend on God, for it is God who is working in you both to will and to work according to his good purpose. We already noted the phrase, for it is God who is working in you, in the last section. And this gives us the perfect balance we do our part because God always does his part first. God always makes the first move. Salvation is God's work from beginning to end, from first to last. It is perfectly fine to say, I found the Lord, as long as we understand he found us first. This verse also tells us that God gives both the will and the ability to do what he commands us. First, he changes our want to, and then he gives us the power to obey. In our tradition, we call this work of God sanctification. Sanctification means being set apart to do God's work. At some point, point in the life of the believer, we come to understand that we don't have the power in our own strength to follow God as we wish to. So in a crisis moment, we turn to God completely and commit ourselves to serve him fully with our whole lives. And then he supplies his Holy Spirit to make that happen. What God demands, he supplies. And from that crisis point and on and on for the rest of our lives, God works out his perfect plan in our lives through the power of the Holy Spirit within us. Yes, we must do our part, but we could never do our part unless God did his part first. And his part involves giving us both the desire and whatever else we need to fulfill his purpose in us. And if we need anything else along the way, he will give it to us. Third, I will not complain. It says in verse 14, do everything without grumbling and arguing. Star quality Christians make a, a, a third commitment and the word arguing might be better translated as murmuring. That's a word that sound conveys its meaning. Murmur, 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 murmur. Like, like the English words hiss or hum. Uh, it has the idea that of muttering under your breath. Do we understand that complaining is an attack 
on God's reign in your lives. Every time you complain about your circumstances, you're really saying, if I were God, I wouldn't do it like this. I'd do something else. The complainer has forgotten the first rule of spiritual life. He's God, and I'm not. It's all a matter of focus, isn't it? What we look at determines what we see. If we focus on our problems, then we will fill our minds until we see nothing else. But when we focus on the Lord and his goodness, we see our problems in the light of eternity. God doesn't work on our timetable. Once we grasp that, we need not complain against the Lord. Fourth, I will be different in order to make a difference. Going on verse 15 through the middle of 16, so that you may be blameless and pure children of God who are faultless in a crooked and perverted generation among whom you shine like stars in the world by holding firm to the word of life. With this commitment, we come to the, the heart, the meat of our text. Paul uses three key words to describe how we should live. The first is blameless, above reproach. No serious accusation can stick. The second word is pure, high quality, an unmixed alloy. What you see is what you get, pure. And then faultless fit to be offered to God like a lamb without spot or blemish, faultless, blameless, pure, faultless. We will be able to make an impact on the world by lives that are visibly, observably, measurably, noticeably, and obviously different from the people around us. We are to be different so that we can make a difference. Our values set us apart from the surrounding culture. Well, why is that so important? Why should we be straight arrows in our lifestyle? Because we live in a crooked and perverse or perverted generation. This word crooked comes from the Greek word skolios from which we get the English word scoliosis, a, a curvature of the spine. Uh, the, the word perverted is a much stronger word in essence. It, it means crooked by choice. Some people are messed up because of their circumstances or the fact that they don't know any better, while others live that way on purpose, by choice. We live within a culture that allows and even applauds values that are contrary to what the Bible teaches us are true and right. We must be heard on these issues, whether they be in areas of honesty or sexual purity, protection of the unborn and the infirm, racism, human dignity, uh, and the list goes on and on. But more than speaking out, we have to live out the truths of God's word. They need to be evident in our lives. How do you show somebody that they're using a crooked stick? By laying a straight stick next to it. We can argue the point until the cows come home and it won't make any difference. So let us simply and quietly resolve to live out our faith in the most beautiful way possible. The change that we seek has to start in us. You see, the world can ignore our arguments, but it cannot ignore a godly example, a godly life. There is no answer for a life, a marriage, a family that is transformed by God's spirit. So what happens when we live like that? 
the world notices the difference. As Paul says, we will shine like stars. We will hold forth the word of life. People will see the way we live. They will notice the difference. The light of Christ will be seen in us. And when they ask us the reason for the way we live, we can share the word of life with them. And then the last point, the last commitment that we make with our lives, I will live for others. The rest of verse 16 through the end says, Then I can boast in the day of Christ <clears throat> that I didn't run or labor for nothing. But even if I am poured out as a drink offering on the sacrificial service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. In the same way, you should also be glad and rejoice with me. This is the last commitment that we make, to live for others and not for self. Paul explains it in two key phrases. First, he says that he looks forward to boasting about the Philippians when Christ returns. He envisions a day when he will stand before the Lord Jesus and give an accountability of his ministry. In that day, he plans to boast about what the Philippians have done for their own generation. That leads me to another question. What will you boast about when you stand before the Lord? You had a great job. Your big bank account. That new house. All the important people you know. Do you think that those things will impress the Lord Jesus Christ? I don't think so. In that day, the only thing that will matter is the impact that you have made on others for the cause of Christ. Everything else will simply fade away. Second, Paul mentions being poured out as a drink offering on their behalf. This, this refers to the Old Testament practice of pouring wine on top of an animal sacrifice so that the heat of the fire immediately vaporizes the wine, turning it into a beautiful aroma. He's saying, even if I end up losing my life for you, it won't matter to me as long as you end up living for Christ. With that statement, we come to the bottom line of Christian service. I wonder how many of us can truly say that it doesn't matter whether we live or die so long as the people we know follow the Lord. I have just returned from a month-long sabbatical and vacation. During my reading while I was on sabbatical, when I wasn't holding my newborn granddaughter. I read about a missionary retreat in Nigeria. Behind a chapel on the grounds, there's a missionary graveyard. It contains about 60 graves of men and women who made the ultimate sacrifice for the sake of the gospel. A half or maybe more of the graves are children, most of them dying in the first days or weeks of life. I, I read that in the early part of the 20th century, the life expectancy of a missionary to Africa was only eight years. There is a grave with a man's name on it that, and the dates 1919 through 1953. That's what, 34 years? The marker read, placed in loving memory by his wife and children. And underneath are the two words, abundantly satisfied. The inscription for one young girl read, she is with her best friend and Lord, Jesus. The missionary graveyard sends this message. God's grace is free, but it is never cheap. These missionaries and their children buried their bear testimony to the high cost of the Great Commission. Reaching the Word has never been easy. 
And Jesus knew that it wouldn't be. That's why he said in John 16, 33, you will have suffering in this world. It has always been true from the very first day. First they killed the prophets, then they killed the apostles one by one, except for John who died an old man in Ephesus. Many centuries ago, Tertullian declared that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Wherever the church has gone, the cost of a new field has always been paid in blood. On another grave marker that was for a, a little child, the inscription reads something like this. We plant this seed in the hope that it will someday bear a harvest of souls for the kingdom. Consider Hebrews chapter 11, verses 35 through 38, and it's a list of believers who suffered for their faith. It says this, Others were tortured and refused to be released. Some faced jeers and flogging, while still others were chained and put in prison. They were sawed in two. They were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. And then this wonderful phrase, the world was not worthy of them. Does it seem like too much? Does it seem like the price is too high to pay? Before you answer, I remember what God did when he sent his son to the world. Think of what it cost him to provide salvation for a human race that had turned against him. God also buried his son on the mission field. You are the light of the world. You shine like stars in the world. You see, the world has its stars, and God has his. God help us to shine like stars so that others will see Jesus in us. Let's pray together. Lord God, you have called us and given us a great gift, this gift of salvation. And you have also called us to be your witnesses in the world. Lord, we ask that not only that you would equip us, but that you would go before us and, and behind us, that you would give us boldness to speak and to live the lives of believers in a world, that we would shine in this place where you have placed us that we would shine as bright lights in a dark world. We give you praise and glory and honor in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you and have a great week.